Hello everyone, today I'm filming a car I've actually been trying to find to get on the channel for quite some time. This is a BMW 650i. Now I actually used to own a 645 and I am currently of the opinion that if you're in the market for a used car, these are basically the best thing on planet Earth right now. And I shall now take some time to explain to you why. Now, I'll concede that these aren't the perfect car and they are not for everyone, but if you're a petrol head that wants an interesting daily, for the money, I'm just not convinced that they can be beat, especially not if you want a little bit of luxury in your life. You see, my 645 I picked up after having had an E46 330, and I wanted to own my first V8. I sort of took to heart that whole kind of Top Gear mantra of, you're never a petrol head unless you've owned an Alfa Romeo and a V8, and I've now owned several of both. It must be said that I would love to have another V8 and another Alfa Romeo, although the 645 is a rare car in that it's one of the very few I've ever owned that if I had the chance to buy that car back, I would. The 6 Series is something of an oddity in BMW history. You had the 1980s version, which is a much sought after classic and a great looking car. In particular, I think the 635 CSI is a bargain in its own right. You see, compared to many other classic cars of that period, it's actually still relatively sensibly priced. In fact, the 8 Series, with which you could compare it, is now an awful lot more expensive if you want a particularly good example. The modern 6 Series was a revival of what BMW considered to be the grand touring tradition, a car to take on the likes of Jaguar and Aston Martin, and it's for that reason that you'll often see one of these compared with something like an old XKR, or possibly even a 911, although I think in truth comparing one of these with a 911 is just well, it's a bit wrong really, they're different cars for different purposes, made by very different companies with quite different aims. If you want a proper sports car, of course the 911 is going to thrash a 6 Series ass. but the 6 Series is a far superior Grand Tourer. What do I mean by that? Well, for me, a Grand Tourer is a car which has got to have adequate power. It's got to be a very nice place to be, it should sound pretty decent but not be too shouty, and it should have the ability to get you from one side of a country to the other in relative comfort, and when you find a juicy road on the other side, be able to have a little bit of fun too. And really, the 6 Series does all of those things. This, as mentioned earlier, is a 650, not a 645. The obvious difference is the change from a 4.4 to a 4.8 litre V8. When these were introduced in about 2005, the only two options of engine were the 4.4 litre V8, or if you wanted something a bit more economical, you could have a 3 litre straight six. The diesel option didn't come in until the facelift, which introduced this engine in about 2007. This particular car is actually a 56 plated 650i, although it's now wearing a private plate, and as my 6 Series did too, I think most people really can't tell the fact that these are now over 10 year old cars. And that's partly because they are a relatively classic design. Uh, yes, they did get a fair bit of hate at the time, and I can kind of understand why, because the design definitely works from some angles and doesn't from others. And in the tradition of the 8 Series, it's also an enormous car with very little room in the back. It does partially make up for that by having a huge boot, and when I bought my first one, that was of great use to me because I was still in the film industry at the time, and I needed somewhere to put all my film kit that was going to be nice and secure. You see, having a nice expensive camera is no good if it's just sat on your back seat. Unsurprisingly, my insurance company at the time weren't very keen on covering that, so um, this, with its capacious low capacity in the back, was perfect. And let's be honest, you look at a car like this and you don't really think that anything super expensive is going to be in the boot, because it is well, a businessman's express. When 
I was looking for one of these, the main thing that annoyed me was the general lack of manuals. Manuals were available, and they were in fact standard on these cars, with the auto box being an option. Now, of the sort of hundred or so of these that were for sale at the time that I picked mine up, only two were manual. One of them had an awful specification with no real goodies optioned in it and a really nasty light coloured wood trim, the sort of thing that you'd see on a kind of old Jag or Aston Martin and that just isn't me. Uh, my car in fact had I believe the same sort of thing as this which is more of a, a charcoal sort of darker trim and it's a much more modern feeling place. Of course you can wrap them in carb and do whatever you want but I never really liked the sort of old man image that that sort of inlay would give you. The other manual car that I found, the owner had spent, well, quite a bit of time and quite a bit of money trying to make it drive, in his words, right. He was very honest and fair and he said, look, there's nothing technically wrong with the car, but the clutch just isn't very nice to use. And that's something that I've seen echoed in many reviews of the 5 Series that was available at the same time with the same engine and gearbox, and also the M5 and M6, which in America were available with a manual. We only got the SMG. They all said that the gearbox there just wasn't that great. It also helped me justify it at the time that the Autobox claimed ever so slightly better MPG and I knew that I was going to be driving through London quite frequently which is going to involve a lot of stop start traffic and I thought you know what sod it I'll just um, I'll just make do and I will take the auto. Now although this doesn't have paddle shifters or anything like that it does have a gearbox which you can shift manually and the gear selector goes in the correct direction that is to say pull towards for up and push away for down and that I always liked. Another way that you can tell BMW consider this to be a high-end car is the fact that they give you an oil temperature gauge. Now that's as good a point as any to start talking about one of this car's most famous issues. They are known to leak coolant from the engine as a little pipe that basically runs between the V and it essentially fails and starts pouring coolant everywhere. Now although the pipe itself is not particularly expensive, there is officially a huge amount of labour involved in getting to it. Now I researched this a few years ago when I was looking at buying one of these and it turns out that a couple of enterprising gentlemen did build a little fix which involves a little extendable pipe that you can put in which means that you don't have to pull apart the whole top off your engine to get to it. And uh, although it's still not a cheap fix that means it's more along the lines of a thousand pounds rather than several thousand pounds. The other main issue of the time was the fact that for whatever reason BMW decided to use plastic sumps on the auto boxes of these cars. Uh, I, I don't know why you would possibly do that, but they did. My car had already had that problem seen to by the previous owner, and another thing that he and I agreed on was the fact that BMW said that these were gearboxes that were sealed for life in terms of their oil, and I don't believe in sealed for life oil, so he'd already had the whole thing change. In fact, quite a few owners actually took their cars to ZF in Germany to have the gearbox serviced, and that wasn't even anywhere near as expensive as you might think. The easiest way to tell whether your car's gearbox probably needs a little bit of a service is when it changes from second to first fairly abruptly. Now, they don't really tend to break, but just by keeping on top of them and putting fresh oil in, they really do just work a little bit better. Now this car has been modified a little bit and Gary has done a couple of things to the car that I wished I'd done with mine but just never had the time. The big one of course is changing the exhaust around. My 645 as standard just sounded, well, underwhelming from the inside. It, it sounded like a diesel when you were just driving along gently and considering I'd spent all this time lusting after a nice big throaty V8, it was it was kind of heartbreaking. It was only when you were absolutely fully on it did the car sound even remotely interesting. Now there's a couple of ways that you can modify the standard exhaust to improve the sound. Now the route that Gary has chosen is to get Paul the welder out, who's very well known in the E92 and 3 community and who I believe may have worked on my own car. He's a very good chap, so if you're thinking of doing something to your BMW, give him a shout. What he essentially does is open up the stock back box and cover up an amount of the perforations inside. Quite how much he covers up depends on the sort of tone that you want. 
Now, the way that he's done things on this car gives it a more throaty kind of sound, a more typical muscle car kind of tone. So it sounds a bit like this. Now the other thing that you can do is to remove a resonator that's in the center of the exhaust, put a little X-pipe in there, and possibly delete a cat as well. And that will give the car a bit of a raspier sound, a kind of more hard-edged sound, the sort of thing you'd expect from, say, like an M car, that kind of thing. You could, of course, do both, but then you might have a car which is possibly a little bit anti-socially loud. Now my own car I had for 15,000 miles, and um, it gave me basically no trouble whatsoever. All I had to do to it was to put a light bulb into it, and that was a reverse bulb. And I have to say that was a little bit more hassle than I bargained for, because you had to take the rear bumper off to do that, and that was unexpected. Other than that, it needed a couple of rear tyres off me, which were not cheap, and I opted to go for non-run flats, which did improve the ride. This car is running on BC coilovers, so it is considerably firmer than my old car, which was actually a pretty good handling car. Now that gives you a little bit more confidence in the corners, and this car actually steers a little better than I remember mine. I think the suspension in this one may need just a little bit of tweaking, because you can just feel it just, just touching just slightly over some of the more difficult compressions there. Now these do have a sport mode, but I was never really in love with it. It weightens the steering up, which I liked, but what it also did was when you had the car in automatic mode, which to be honest is the mode that I did drive mine in 99% of the time, it then just lets it rev out too much. I mean the car will rev to about 6,500 RPM, which is not too bad for a, a big old V8, and this 4.8 by the way is officially even more economical than mine, which is miraculous. Uh, Power-wise, these are about 360 horsepower and 360 pound-foot of torque, and the 4.4 was about 330 on both counts. Being completely honest, in a straight line, I say that my 645 felt about as quick as my E46 M3. They, they really do shift, and of course, they've got a lot more low-down pull than the M3 does, which needs revving out to do its best work. These are also remarkably light for what they are. BMW spent an awful lot of time and money on making these actually more of a sporty car than you would possibly suspect. The rear tailgate is fiber reinforced plastic. There's lots of aluminium in the car. In fact, the front and rear subframes are both aluminium. There's aluminium and plastic at the front as well. Now, officially these weigh about 1,615 kilos, which is essentially the same as an E92 M3. In reality, they do weigh a little bit more than that, but that's pretty impressive. They're still, say, lighter than a C63 at the time, and it means that this always handled a lot better than you'd expect a big old barge. Indeed, coming from an E46, everything about this car just felt nicer and better. One of the problems that the 6 Series had was that it was a lot more money than a 5 Series. And on the face of it, you'd look at it and you'd go, well, why? Because the 5 Series is the more practical car and it's basically the same thing. Well, anybody that's been in a 6 Series will know that just everything about the 6 Series is just that little bit nicer. They really did put the effort in to make it feel a little bit more premium. The leather in here is really nice. This car's actually got a very nicely specced interior with this kind of burgundy uh, stuff here. Now the dashes in all of these is black and the whole car is full of little details. Even things like the rear lights have got little ridges in them because in the wind tunnel BMW found that the airflow around the rear of the car wasn't quite perfect and so they put those little ridges in and it just smoothed things out and just made the whole thing that much better. This car looks absolutely ace too. The standard car is just a touch soft. I had a little eBay splitter on mine, and this one is wearing a Maxton design item, which looks great. I'm also glad that Gary has kept the silver wheels on it, and it just really looks spot on. From the rear, these aren't the prettiest and most shapely car, but the upside is that you do get that huge boot. Now the back seats are um, a touch on the useless side. Now I used to get my mother in there, but then she's only about five foot three and fairly small, so that's kind of easy. They're basically two buckets in the bag. I suppose that's maybe one reason people compared them with the 911, because, well, if you're thinking of sports cars with two small useless back seats, 911 would be it. 
maybe it's more like a Jag XK again in that front. It, they're emergency seats. Just just think of them like that. And that's perhaps a slight annoyance if you're thinking of a nice big car as having lots of room in it. What these do have is an awful lot of features as standard, and it's something to be wary of if you're considering buying one of these. I've seen a lot of people list things that are optional extras that in fact was standard with these cars. So Xenon lights, standard. Electric seats, standard. Heated, apparently, an option. Front and rear parking sensors, standard. Leather, standard. Sunroof in this, I believe, standard. No, I'm not sure I spell on that one. I've seen a few people recently whinge and complain and say that these German cars don't last anywhere near as long as people would think that they do. This one apparently is on 228,000 miles. And if you told me it was on a tenth of that, I would believe you. This is in incredible condition for a vehicle of that mileage. Properly looked after, these things really will do moon miles. As you can probably tell, I have an awful lot of love for the 6 Series. However, in the interest of being fair and balanced, I should probably give you a few things that aren't so good about it. First off, it is a very large car, despite the fact that it is only really a 2 plus 2. If you are trying to drive it around a city, as I've done quite a bit of, you really do need to keep your wits about you. You can't really place the front end that easily, so you do need to keep a watchful eye out of potholes, curbs and the like if you're going to take it through a city. Of course, being a nearly 5 litre V8, I'm not going to make any claims that it's a parsimonious car, although when you're on a run it can actually be pretty damn good. I used to achieve a, around about 30 odd to the gallon when I was on a run and Gary says that he gets the same if not a little bit better in this and the official figures would seem to confirm that. As with any big thirsty V8, when you decide to drive it around town things rapidly get a lot worse so expect kind of low teens if you're going to drive this around town quite a bit. I do remember quite vividly that week where I spent £300 in fuel in mine, but in the car's defence I was doing a lot of miles back then and I was also billing them, so I didn't really worry too much at what the fuel cost me. My personal justification was also the fact that for me to drive to London and back still cost less in this than it did to get a train down at last minute notice and my car left whenever I told it to rather than the train which left when it decided it wanted to. This also has the lower end specification iDrive. My car had the navigation option and that was an option at the time. I know you might think that a big expensive executive car should have that kind of thing as standard but sadly they didn't. Of course these days most people are going to use one of their apps to navigate and so I think that's less of a problem. It's a shame that it's got the smaller screen because the bigger one really does kind of bring the interior alive. The other options that my car had, which I personally enjoyed and I'd maybe recommend you trying to find on a car, were the Logic 7 sound system, which still is the best factory sound system I've ever had in a car. It was magnificent. Quite a surprise because the worst upgraded sound system I've ever had in a car was the Harman Kardon system in my E46. BMW, that it seems, can't really make their mind up whether they want good or bad sound systems. Hey ho, that was just one of the other ways in which the 6 Series always felt like a more premium car to me. And the other thing my car had, which does seem to be a very rare option indeed, was the heads up display. Now those were standard on the M6, but almost never seen on the regular cars. And for driving around it was actually quite nice. Because I had the nav system, it spoke to it, and so when you're driving around somewhere that you didn't know that well, you could just sort of tell where you were going and it would come up here and you wouldn't have to look down there and it was actually pretty nice you had your speed and you could configure it and do whatever you want and when you're talking about a 2005 car it's a pretty cool option to have had the one option i'll maybe warn people against is the active body control option now i never actually saw any cars specified with this but it did exist it was a system, not unlike the one that Mercedes did at the same time, which was supposed to help the car corner really flat even when you were on tricky surfaces. And it had some fancy interconnected anti-roll bar type design, something like that, the, the specifics of which escaped me. What I do remember about it is all the forums talking about all of the examples which had broken and they were having a hell of a hard time getting repaired for anything approaching a reasonable cost. 
So just be wary of that one. And really, what more have I got to say about one of these? Well, if you want to pick one up, I've seen these go for as little as about £3,000. Now, granted, that would be a 645 with a load of miles on it. But for 10 grand, you could pick up a mint, gorgeous, no mile example one of these. And if you really love everything about it, but you just don't want that big thirsty V8, well, they did do a diesel. They did do a 635D. They do command a little bit more money because they were the sort of more desirable, cheaper to run cars. But I always personally thought, you know what? The V8s were so much cheaper to buy that the running costs really, you would never recoup when you had the diesel. I also personally would just not bother with the 630. And there's lots of them about, and annoyingly, quite a few of them are manual. But it's not a very powerful engine for quite a big car. It's 260 horsepower. It's the same engine that I had in my 1 Series. And in a 1 Series, it works all right. But in a 6, it was just not quite enough. And as a result, you didn't really get much better fuel economy than you do from this glorious 8. So there we have it the BMW 650i, my favourite used car. What's yours? Thanks everyone for watching. Please like, comment below, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already because it does make a big difference to me and the channel. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye bye.